Tim, welcome back to Watchbox Reviews. This is Watches Live 28. Watches Live 28, guys, can you believe we've got this far? Uh, to celebrate this completely insignificant numerical milestone, I have some of the most interesting watches we've ever assembled here tonight. Now, this show's gonna be a little bit more interactive than others. So if you have the live chat capability on your browser, please join in. I wanna give a quick shout out to Eddie Lonsberg, longtime friend of the brand from the Watch You Want Days. Welcome, Mozart, Russell996, Weber Fan, Hale Bop, Don Gizel from Germany. Welcome aboard, folks. Let's get started. I promised you Audemars Piguet to Zenith. Let me give you Audemars Piguet, a most unconventional Conventional AP is this one goes nowhere near the world of Genta inspired pseudo octagonal bezels. This is the Jules Audemars equation of time. So you have a perpetual calendar, you have an equation of time. This one, in rather fascinating and geographically proximate fashion, is designed for Palm Beach. So if you're native to my old haunt, South Florida, this watch would be just about ideal for you. It can be recammed for any part of the world, however, so don't worry, you can tailor it to suit. Now on the case back, you can see Audemars Piguet 2120, and this is a more ornate and one might even say Baroque finish compared to what you'll see on something like the 15202 Jumbo. For one thing, you can see that here, the winding mass has been entirely skeletonized and freehand engraved to incorporate the Audemars and Piguet initials. You'll also note that this is a unique ultra thin. It dates back to 1967, co-developed by and for Patek, Audemars Piguet, and Vacheron by JLC. It was known as the 920. JLC never used it, but every other one of those brands did. It's an ultra thin, and there's an annular winding mechanism, so you actually have a complete ring around the movement, and this ring moves on four separate pivot jewels. There's one at each corner, so that it can be ultra flush to the movement and yet never collide with the movement because it's supported on all four corners by those jewels. It beats away at a quirky 19,800 vibrations per hour. And because of this freehand engraved rotor, no two are exactly alike. Now this is a brass knuckle punch of visual power. A guilloche dial, the real thing, not stamped, hand applied, diamond polished gold indices. Whether you live in Palm Beach or not, this is a superb perpetual calendar. A little mention of what the equation of time is for those who might be new to this complication. It shows the difference between a solar day and mean civil time. So if you are on the ground in any given time zone, solar noon is going to be when the sun is directly overhead. But in Philadelphia, it's dark later than it does in New York. When I call my parents, it's dark. Well, it's still light here. So even in one time zone, it's not really the same time with respect to the position of the sun. So we have a mean or average time for each time zone, each of the 24 primary time zones of the world. So what this complication does is it tells you the difference between mean civil time and solar time, the difference between noon where you are and that time when the sun is actually directly overhead. And now this varies through the year from roughly negative 15 to plus 15, and you can see how it's calibrated along the bezel with this small wandering sun index that actually tells you the difference between solar and civil. And finally, because there are four times a year when the two coincide, that's when it will be fixed exactly at zero. So that's what the equation of time does. And this is the Jules Audemars perpetual calendar equation of time. Now this is a great example of why pre-owned watches are like a miracle. Because this watch, about 12 years ago, 12 to 15, was a $108,000 timepiece. Today, we're selling this one for about $34,500. So if you did want to customize it and have it made geographically proximate to your location, latitude and longitude, you'd have plenty left in the tank buying this at a pre-owned price. Okay, right off the bat, I can see we've got lots of friends joining us. Uh, my old haunt, Hollywood, Florida, Simon Holt from another Hollywood that's not Hollywood, Hollywood, Northern Ireland, and Weberfan1234, Audemars Piguet continues to surprise me with the non-sports pieces. We've had some great ones. I gotta tell you guys, Audemars Piguet makes some of the best non-sports watches you will ever encounter. From grand complication to ultra-thin watches to metier d'art, there is great value to be had in APs that are not Royal Oaks. I cannot overemphasize this. If you want to get the best value in tourbillon, minute repeaters, jump hours, perpetual calendars, equation of time, AP is the name. Look for one of the Schaefer-cased rectangular or tonneau-cased 
Schaefer jump hour minute repeaters built by Renoe Papi in the early 90s, that's the high complication division of AP, you can pick those up for under $50,000. A hand finished handmade jump hour minute repeater, no joke. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's why I love AP and why I particularly love AP non-Royal Oak pre-owned. Okay, but I promised you high horology and it doesn't stop with AP. We've got just about all of the Holy Trinity on the table tonight. I'm going to be subbing in FP Jorn for Patek, so Terry Stern, forgive me. But for now, let's stick with the Canon. This is a watch that originally retailed for $146,000. And I'm dying to buy this for myself because we're asking close to half price for this watch that debuted in 2010. Here's what it is. 43 millimeter powered by the old school Le Mans 2310 of Bausch, finished with Virtuosity by Vacheron Constantin. This model made from 2010 to 2016 is a gorgeous platform for the old school Le Mans caliber with Vacheron style. Now it's an easy watch to wear lug to lug because and I'm going to show you because 43 millimeters in my wrist, you wouldn't think the two would go together, but they do. So I'm going to give you a little wrist shot of this one as a primer. Easy to wear thanks to the tuck of the lugs. This one has a little bit of a downturned kick to the lug shape. You can see how they jut down more dramatically at the end. An easy watch to wear on a small wrist. It looks right. If you're into something like a 5070 Patek Philippe chronograph, get the same base movement. The 5070 is 42. This is 43, albeit with a perpetual calendar. This is less money than a 5070 with all of the complication of a 5970 and the same base movement finished to the same degree. Now Vacheron did more than just build a beautiful movement. This dial is a stunning grayscale combination of dark rhodium with black and silver accents. So you've seen dark rhodium. Specifically, you've seen it on the Rolex Yacht Master, the original, the 116622. This is the same thing, and you have that gorgeous opaline or matte finish to resist glare with beautiful faceted white gold dauphines. The successor to this watch is handsome, but I did not appreciate the addition of a tachymeter scale. It crowds the dial. This is perfect. And of course, there's nothing like a big slow beat balance. The newer version of this watch has a higher beat version of the movement. I don't know why they did that. Guys who want traditional watchmaking want to see it big and slow. And this watch gives you the beauty of a lateral clutch, column wheel chronograph movement. Everything from the engagement, the disengagement of the lateral clutch to the recentering hammers acting on the heart cam at center. Nothing is left to the imagination with a manual wind lateral clutch traditional chronograph. Big, beautiful, and blessed with a weird hairspring guard. You can't quite see it, but it's a unique feature to prevent the hairspring. There it is. It's that little gold wire under my finger to prevent the overcoil hairspring from hooking on its own coils or the regulator. This is something Rolex used during the 60s on the Daytonas. I have not seen it used anywhere since. Special stuff from Vacheron and very traditional. All of this in platinum for about $80,000. That's a lot of watch. Okay, joining in, we have lots of friends. I can see Anthony O, very nice VC, Andrew ST12, can't go wrong with all of those white gold Rolexes that Andre Philippe has proposed, asking me, Tim, which white gold Rolex sports watch would you recommend one buy? The Smurf, the BLRO, which is the Pepsi white gold GMT Master, the Daytona on a bracelet, the Daytona on an Oyster Flex. I mean, I would say budget, no object, go for the anniversary Daytona. It, white metal Rolex and precious ain't just white gold, although that's an excellent choice. Consider the brass ring. Those anniversary Daytonas pre-owned actually represent one of the few opportunities to buy a contemporary ceramic bezel Daytona for less than list. So you take a watch that starts at over $70,000, it's going to be somewhat less than that, but I do not believe they will ever be worth less than they are now. Consider it an investment in a store of value that you can wear on your wrist and enjoy on a daily basis. And there is nothing like the heft of a, a solid link full platinum bracelet Daytona on the wrist. It is a divine feeling, glacier blue dial, chocolate ceramic bezel. That would be my first choice. Now, backing off from that, I would say, as much as I love the Smurf, the gloss blue dial, blue Cerachrome, white gold sub, you will see far, far fewer of the GMT Master II BLRO, that first generation watch from 2014 to 2017 with the black dial is already collectible. I'm already seeing a little bit of a bounce in their values. And I do believe that because of the rarity of that watch, 
it will be a collectible. It's already a collectible. It will be an investment. Collectible means there's a collector who has an interest and a community that loves the watch. That already exists. They will gain value. And I can't say that of all the steel watches, which I think are actually going to take a step back in the next three to five years. Buy steel Rolex now. It's a win for the next 10, 20 years. But if you want a watch that's going to gain over the next three to five, as opposed to maybe take a step back with the global economy, which has to cool down at some point, especially the U.S., I would go with the BLRO and look to hold long term. That said, I do have a white gold Rolex Daytona on the table tonight, and I think it's important to bring this one to the fore because it's an unusual combination of features. Now, this is a discontinued model. It is a fully calibrated Arabic numeral dial, white gold Arabic numerals, a gorgeous slate sunburst, and it's a tritone, silver, gray, and red. This is a slick watch, all in white gold. You can see that the combination of the almost honey brown strap with the white metal, the non-ceramic bezel, and the gray tritone dial is very special. Now, this watch is fully loomed. Not every Daytona is. This is one that you can wear full time, and I would recommend because you're not going to sacrifice a Rolex factory bracelet, always hard to dismount emotionally. Putting this one on an Everest strap or a rubber bee and taking advantage of the fact that this watch is designed to be worn on a strap, it would look absolutely awesome on a rubber aftermarket variant. And because it is 100 meters water resistant, this is a watch that should be enjoyed in the pool and at the beach this summer. White gold, discontinued, and a charming, unconventional look about the Daytona. I almost feel this is a Rolex for the guy who doesn't like Rolex. If you wanted to avoid the clone culture that surrounds the cult of Rolex, this would be a great way to get into the brand and a great model line in the Daytona without being duplicative of anything else you'll encounter at your club, your office, or your PTA meeting. Beautiful in-house caliber and recent production. Let's see, I can see Nana Odoro, longtime viewer, joining us. Simon Holt, Purity of Essence, the one in yellow. USK 13F, Steve Place. I can see right now we've got an impressive live audience. Where are the sunglasses? You know what? Honestly, I put them on my head so I don't forget them when I do my lightbox videos, the talking hand stuff. I put on a like Under Armour shirt and I take the glasses off because it's a thousand degrees in that room. So that's where the glasses are. They're downstairs in my studio. Also, I can see bum 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 bum. Weber fan asking where are the sunglasses. I'll gladly accept donations. If anyone wants to send me a set of Cartier Aviators platinum plated, I'm more than open to the proposal. Moving on, we've got watches that are all kinds of special on the table tonight. Not all of them are high complications, Holy Trinity brands, or precious metal. This one actually does incorporate a degree of precious metal, but not in the way you would expect. This is a watch that's been an absolute sensation. If you ever wanted to know which Speedmaster limited edition to own, other than the original 18 karat yellow gold Apollo 11 commemorative, I would say this. I never imagined when this came out in 2015, the silver Snoopy 2, that we'd be looking at the same watch priced at more than double its original MSRP in 2018. Now it's a very special watch, because it's not what you expect on several levels. The tachymeter is ceramic. The crystal is sapphire. The tachymeter is also fully loomed, as is Snoopy. Snoopy is loomed. Every single block index you see here is an inverse of what you expect. Rather than having a luminescent inlay on a index, you actually have a fully luminescent block. So it's a block of luminova with a lacquered black cap, so it glows in three dimensions at night. Snoopy glows, the tachymeter glows. This has 14 frames representing 14 seconds that the retro rockets were fired on Apollo 13 during one of the more minor maneuvers to get back into re-entry. You'll also note that there is a quote at the center of the dial. If you can't quite see it, Harrison's gonna work with me here. But it says, failure is not an option, which is actually a quote from the movie. But you know what? The movie was great and part and parcel to the Apollo 13 legend. Now turn the watch over. Here's where the precious metal comes into play. It is a sterling silver Snoopy. Now the silver Snoopy was an award given to NASA suppliers for excellent performance in the field. And of course, the original Speedmaster Professional was part of the kit that helped the Apollo 13 crew nurse their crippled capsule back to Earth. And the Speedmaster being a big part of that, Omega received a Silver Snoopy Award. 2003, Omega released the first of the Silver Snoopy limited editions. That watch 
considerably less special and considerably more numerous than this one, is also a collector's piece, but with 1,970 of these made, you have both a freehand engraved Snoopy, so the original had a lacquered inlay on the case back. This is better. No two of these are exactly alike. This is the, this is the Charles Schultz drawing, freehand engraved by Omega Artisans, and on the case back behind it, you ha actually have a vitreous enamel, so it's both engraved and enameled. This is a special watch. Inside, moon watch caliber, 1861 manual wind, 21,600 vibrations per hour, shock resistant to impulses of 5,000 G. It's actually more shock resistant than the later X33. So this is a special watch, 42 millimeters stainless steel. Okay, now there's a lot more going on here. Uh, I have a great deal of complications to share with you, but I think I'm gonna share one of the most misunderstood Rolex watches of the modern era with you. So this is a crazy timepiece. The Rolex Yachtmaster II. Be kind, guys, this is the one that was known as the Clown Master when it debuted at Basel World 2007, and I think you can see why. A combination of red, white, blue, and gold. The watch is, quite honestly, a real movement snob option hiding in plain sight. You look at it, you think, Ublo. You think AP Royal Oak 44 millimeter, maybe the Biblos limited edition. But this watch is as smart on the inside as any grand complication from Patek Philippe. Caliber 4160 is featured in this watch, is a vertical clutch column wheel chronograph caliber with a three-day power reserve, Liga profiled train wheels. That's right, Liga etching technology. Rolex didn't even announce. It is a programmable countdown timer. It is also a flyback and a fly forward, meaning if your countdown is closer to eight minutes, it's gonna fly forward to eight. If your countdown is closer to nine, it's gonna fly back to nine. Now, it's designed for regatta and specifically for matches within the regatta, a sailboat race. The countdown is critical and it varies. So you have the ability to program this watch to any time between one and 10 minutes and then there's a countdown. So when you start it, the chronograph runs backwards. Now, a lot of folks will say that seems awfully specialized. I will say this is probably the most useful Rolex chronograph that is made because most intervals you measure with a chronograph are gonna be relatively short. The ability to customize your countdown means this is an ideal cooking timer for summer grilling. Fish tacos are awfully sensitive, guys. The kids time out, intervals remaining between meetings. If you've got four minutes to break before a presentation, you can get back in time with the Yacht Master 2 and then ace the style segment. Now this is, as of 2007, the most complicated Rolex movement ever made. Narrowly edged in 2012 by the Sky Dwellers caliber 9001, but this one is more jeweled, that one has more parts, so it remains a dead heat. Fly back and fly forward. Let me show you how this one works. <coughs> I apologize to everyone for that mortar round cough. You can send the medical bills to Watchbox. Okay, so here's how this works. The first thing you do is you thread out the crown. So the crown pops out into its first position. The second thing you do is you rotate the ring command bezel counterclockwise. Now this is important because the ring command bezel is physically part of the movement, yet the watch is still 100 meters water resistant. Now that you've justified counterclockwise, you compress the pusher at four. Now you can program the watch to any time between one and 10 minutes, and you can see how I can actually set it to any time that I so please. And then it will remember through every reset and restart until I reprogram it. So it is a programmable memory, fly back, fly forward, vertical clutch, column wheel, countdown timer. It is all of that. And then when you take the ring command and you place it back into position, you'll note the pusher at four o'clock pops out you can thread your crown back in. And now that all of that is done and dusted, you can start your chronograph. And of course it's a flyback. That is a fun watch. If you're bold enough to wear full gold, and let's face it, for some, Rolex means gold, and gold means yellow gold. This is about as bold as it comes in gold. Okay, and I can see 
Ryu's not a fan, and Andrew ST12 saying that's a very expensive egg timer. That's a fact, but it's an excellent egg timer, the best available. Rolex wants you to know that. So compared to that, I think you'd have to say this is a model of discretion in yellow gold timepieces. This is the great IWC Da Vinci Perpetual Calendar Ratropon. Now this is reference 3751. It's a model that debuted during the 1980s and it combines the Kurt Claus perpetual calendar system fully coordinated so you can never accidentally set the indications out of sequence. If you can adjust a three hand Rolex date watch, you can adjust the perpetual calendar and the moon face just by turning to the current date. Now you have the day, you have the date, you have the month, you have the year, you have the decade, you have the century, you have the millennium, and of course you have a gorgeous aventurine moon phase. I'm gonna try to get as close as I can and hold this steady so we can capture the aventurine, but it is a gorgeous aventurine moon phase disc. And you can see a little bit of that magical glassy sparkle. The watch is 39 millimeters in yellow gold with hinge lugs, and this was the purest expression of IWC's dedication to high horology during the 1980s. The split second functionality came a little bit later during the early 90s. That's when the 3751 debuted using Richard Hobring's split second technology integrated into a value 7750 movement. You can see this watch actually used a plexiglass dive watch crystal to clear the combination of hands and complications. So it has a very charming bubble-like shape. It's a, a truly endearing and wearable watch. You can see with those hinge lugs, this watch will wear well on anything. I understand not everyone's into yellow gold, but if that's the case, we have a very similar 3750 in white gold. Same hinge lugs, same Kurt Claus perpetual calendar system. This one's not a split second, but if you want a little bit more discretion, you don't want quite the most eccentric IWC you can buy. This is more like the second most eccentric IWC you can buy. A perfect fit on any wrist. You could fit this watch on a wrist as small as 13 centimeters circumference, and it would be a perfect match. It has the same aventurine moon phase, the same charmingly weird dive watch style profile, and of course, those same hinge lugs. That's a watch that is truly compact across the wrist. Double hinged, double jointed lugs. I can see uh, Sebastian Palacio saying that Da Vinci is beautiful. I actually agree. I can see Andrew ST12 saying, I prefer the VC from earlier. Honestly, so do I. For 85,000, I would be all over the VC. For perhaps a quarter of that, I might be all over that white gold Da Vinci. All things in perspective, you get tremendous value from the IWC, cost no object finish and watchmaking from Vacheron in the Patrimony Traditional Chronograph Perpetual. That said, if you want a watch that looks like a million dollars, but isn't and gives you a totally unique aesthetic, you have to consider a watch that bowed towards the end of the 2000s, the era when bigger was better. This is the Zenith Chronomaster XXT Open Concept. Now, the concept series from Zenith in this period involved sapphires over entirely engine-turned dials. So you have a sapphire that actually covers the dial and the rest of the watch. You have a second sapphire on which the scale for the power reserve, sub-seconds, and all of the numerals are matched. So there is a second sapphire that creates the appearance of floating indications and complications on the dial. You also have a titanium case entirely media blasted. So it's not a satin finish, it's not a polish. It is an almost magically matte titanium finish in grade two that is bewitching, a wonderful contrast with the brilliant rhodium plated engine turning of the dial. It's a striking combination on a watch that wears better than anything 45 millimeters has any right to. Let me demonstrate. This is the watch, 45 millimeters on my 16 centimeters circumference wrist. It's an easy fit across the wrist. You can see there's no lug overlap, even though I'm pulling this thing strangulationly tight. I mean, I, I am constricting myself like some sort of large predatory snake and yet this thing will not overlap the edge of my wrist. So this is a good fit for a smaller wrist that has a preference for bigger watches. Easy to wear, comfortable because it's light in titanium and hypoallergenic. It also has a gorgeous caliber 4021 El Primero. So you can see the escapement rattling away at 10 beats per second, 36,000 vibrations per hour on the dial side. 
the open bridge is the key to this architecture because you can actually see everything from the escape wheel to the pallet to the balance and the hairspring, plus an enormous extended fourth wheel pinion that turns into a tri-spoke constant seconds indicator. You can see on the case back that it's as gorgeous as any El Primero, primarily machine finished, but a handsome chronograph with an open architecture that's easy to see. The El Primero has always been a treat from both sides, but with the open escapement, you don't have to worry about viewing the case back. You can show this one off to your friends at the dinner table and induct them into the cult of high horology simply by showing them that escapement. It's 90% of the visual interest of a tourbillon at 10% of the price. El Primero Chronomaster Open Concept XXT. Gorgeous watch, and you can really see that media blasted titanium finish. That's a special piece. Okay. Let's talk about something old, really old. 1972 old. So in 1972, Hoyer and Viceroy Cigarettes decided they were going to kill us all with a smile. And for 88 bucks and proof of purchase, you could purchase a... Hoyer Ottavia 1163 Viceroy Edition. Now, the Viceroy Edition was an interesting take on the caliber 12 powered Ottavia. 42 millimeters across, about 47 millimeters lug to lug, and powered by the caliber 12. This was a wacky confluence of tobacco, micro rotor automatic winding, motorsports, aviation, horology, and American pop culture. Now, it has a curious combination of a tachymeter with a rotating bezel. So the idea was that with the rotating tachymeter bezel, you had all options open. You could use the tachymeter for timing the speed of something at the racetrack, or you could treat it as a conventional timing mechanism and just mark the quarters using reference points and, tr and basically treat it like a dive bezel, albeit on the surface. Now, it is the caliber 12, the the high beat 21,600 vibration per hour variant of the caliber 11. So it's a quirky combination of a Buren Micro Rotor 1280 caliber combined with a Dubois de Praz chronograph module. This was the great answer to the El Primero, the rival to the El Primero and the Seiko reference 6139 chronograph. This was the watch that likely won, or the movement that likely won the race to be the first automatic chronograph caliber. It's a hamburger of a movement, and it didn't outlast the 70s for the most part, but it's a wonderful part of history, and if you're into Hoyer, but you don't want to pay the ransom for a vintage Carrera, and you don't want to pay the ransom for a vintage Monaco from the 70s, this is the way to go, is this dial is antiseptic. The only, the only scratching and tarnishing you're looking at is on the plexiglass. This is a watch that's on a glorious American-made extensible clasp, and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean, but uh, I actually happen to love the look of the stretchy claspless bracelet and the Ottavia, the 1163 Viceroy, also known as a fourth series 1163 Ottavia. This is a watch that's got it all going on. A couple of interesting threads of history, and you'll note how intact this one is. If you look, you can see the original sunburst case finish radiating out from its imaginary center point. So this watch is both in wonderful untouched condition and almost factory to the point that the dial and the case look like they've been scarcely brushed since the 1970s. Combine it with that awesome period extensible bracelet, and this is a wonderful everyday watch. Sure to get in wet or rough, this is a watch you could wear full time. And it's a piece of history. Okay. Lots of interesting questions and comments going on. Someone asking, Alvin, Tim without the sunglasses. Yes, I forgot them in the other room. Ray Bonifun joining us. Fjord Prefic joining us. He's on hotel Wi-Fi. I feel your pain, man. I feel that pain. I've been there. It's not a good place. But thank you for joining us. Um, I can also see El Señor Jesus. sent some fantastic high horology, high complication watches. He thinks that the concept is too odd and unreadable. That's true. It's not one of their high horology pieces. If you want to see real Zenith high horology porn, look up the Georges Favre Jaco. Or even better, look up the Georges Favre Jaco Tourbillon or one of the Christophe Coulomb watches. Special pieces. Christophe Coulomb may be unwearable, but special pieces. Finally, I want to go out with a bang. So what will I pick? Hmm. How about a watch that flies way under the radar? I'm going to go <laughs> with a Breguet alarm you may never have seen. 
That's what it sounds like. Now see what it looks like. This is the early 1990s Breguet Classique, sometimes known as the Breguet Marine Alarm. It uses a Lamagna 2980 caliber that's actually related to the original Omega Memomatic caliber 980. Now the watch is a little bit of a weird duck. Platinum with a guilloche 18 karat gold dial that's then been silvered. There's a lot of precious metal going on here. It is a gorgeous timepiece in the style of the modern Breguet wristwatch conventions, Breguet hands, guilloche rose lathe dial in gold and silvered. You can see the coined case, the soldered on lugs, not held with screws, not stamped, soldered on and double finished to remove evidence the joint. This is an exquisite handmade watch. Now, if you're not familiar with the caliber 2980, it's one of the more remarkable alarm calibers you'll encounter. Let's put it in the setting mode and I'll show you exactly what I mean. You actually have a double index for setting the alarm. It has that quirky tendency to move the hands in reverse as you set the alarm, but you can set them independently by going back into hand setting mode. Now, you can see there is an hour and a minute index, so you can actually set this watch to the minute. How close can you get? Well, two minutes is as close as I've ever gotten, but I'll also say that's the closest I've ever gotten on any alarm watch, so this is a special piece. This is a watch you will rarely see. With its pre-1995 hallmarks from the InvestCorp era of Breguet, it's part of a select group of premium timepieces that were made in that era. Those were dark days. Production was low. Quality didn't always match the Breguet name. This is one of the few exceptions and one of the true highlights and high watermarks of that era. One of the most precise alarms you'll ever encounter and one of the most beautiful and discreetly styled traditional dress watches, this is a timepiece for all occasions. The Breguet Classique 3600, sometimes called the Marine Alarm, this is one you've gotta own. If you're into platinum watches, if you're into alarm, if you're into early modern Breguet, and a timepiece literally no one you know is gonna have, consider this one video to come on Watchbox Watch Reviews. Thank you all who joined me tonight. It was a bit of a ride. We're going to be focusing on some new giveaways in the immediate future. We gave away our Bird Valle Horological Sculpture. We're going to be giving away watches. And for me, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the contest I want to win. We're going to be giving away everything from Seiko Astron GPS to Rolex. So you're going to want to stay tuned. If you're not subscribed to this channel, you're going to want to do that. I also want to remind you guys to follow Watchbox Global and Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. It's where the action continues after the broadcast. Until then, I'm Tim, they're the crew, this is Watchbox Reviews, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.